In 1940, audiences witnessed Rebecca, produced by David Oselznik and directed by Alfred Hitchcock, which was originally adapted from a 1938 novel of the same name, written by English writer Daphne du Maurier. Selznick wanted to be extremely faithful to the original, which put a lot of pressure on Hitchcock, who later stated in a 1966 interview with Truffaut that the film did not entirely belong to him. Rebecca explores the theme of finding a place in the world, and does hint on a very interesting idea that for one to find a true identity, one needs to assume a false one first. As the protagonist is a woman, he does explore this theme for the reality that women found themselves at the time. So even though one might argue that the story explores quite a universal theme, it will automatically touch on the topic of feminism, just due to the simple reality of gender inequality. Even though the film is a psychological thriller, the original source was much more focused on the psychological aspect of the story and those iconic thriller elements were something that Hitchcock brought to the film. In her book Women Who Knew Too Much, Tanya Modlewski explores the relationship dynamic in the film for the famous Freud theory known as Oedipus Complex, to quickly brush over it. The Oedipus Complex is a term used by Sigmund Freud in his theory of psychosexual stages of development to describe a child's feeling of desire for his or her opposite sex parent and jealousy and anger towards his or her same sex parent. Maxim in this case takes on the role of the father in the film. Rebecca assumes the role of the mother and our main protagonist is the child. Maleski later expresses this idea about how in order to win the father's affection, the girl has to compete with her mother but still uses her as an example for her own identity, subsequently becoming her. And to find her true self, she needs to move on from that false image and kill off the mother. The film follows an unnamed young woman who meets mysterious but dashing George Forescu Maximilian de Winter, aka Maxim, a widower who lost his wife to the sea. Our protagonist soon falls for Maxim becoming the second Mrs. De Winter and they return to Maxim's grand home estate, Manderley. Mrs. De Winter struggles with her role as the lady of the house. She's naive and feels like a lost child there. Something the film goes out of its way to tell us. Oh, come on, eat it up like a good girl. Do I have to put it on? Yes, certainly, certainly, certainly. Can't be too careful with children. And if that wasn't enough, the doorknobs in the house are placed on a shoulder level to her, implying that Manderley is out of reach. Moreover, she has to constantly deal with being compared to the first Mrs. De Winter, Rebecca, who is a perfect foil, sophisticated, accomplished, and exciting. Everything that Maxim seems to desire. Something common in our patriarchal society is a lot of young girls learn to extract their inner self-value from a male point of view. Both Rebecca and Mrs. De Winter are polar opposites in appearances as well. Our protagonist is a blonde, while Rebecca was stayed to be a brunette. Mrs. De Winter dons light pastel colors for most of the film, while black dominates Rebecca's wardrobe. No doubt then that when Maxim's sister is surprised to see how blandly Mrs. De Winter dresses, she goes on to dress up for Maxim in a black gown. She's afraid that Maxim is still in love with Rebecca and tries her best to assume the identity that would be much more desirable to him. She tries to assume that false identity. Manderley has a character of its own in the film. The mansion with huge halls and intricate design exhibiting all its history is shown to be sacred with reference to Rebecca's spirit still residing there. It's a labyrinth for our main character who appears to be overwhelmed by Manderley's world, wandering helplessly in search of answers and along the way pronounces herself dead among all the other silly little things including breaking a precious china cupid. Also noteworthy is the fact that Hitchcock never shows us any pictures of Rebecca. When the main character asks one of Maxim's employees what Rebecca used to be like, he replies, I suppose she was the most beautiful creature I ever saw. Allowing the audience themselves to create an image of the most beautiful woman, and making the absence of Rebecca more powerful and even more terrifying. To quote Madleski again, the point of horror resides in the blind space. By keeping us in the dark and letting us imagine Rebecca, Hitchcock fulfills the sensibility of the Dumerier novel. This approach to not show her at all is way scarier since we literally feel her presence. Hitchcock challenges the audience to piece together a puzzle consisting of an intricate sound and set design. Listen to the sea. If there's anybody who misses the winter is even more terrified of, it's Mrs. Danvers, the housekeeper who is madly obsessed with Rebecca. Safe to say that she might have been romantically involved with her deceased mistress. 
Though her screen time is limited, her scenes with our character are nerve-wracking and impactful. Hitchcock stated later why her movements in the film were very deliberately limited and controlled. As little as possible showed Mrs. Danvers Aussi moving into a room where the girl was. That the girl heard a sound and she was always standing there. You never ça. know where she oui. is or where she's going Quelle to be. She's always there. Elle est toujours oui. là. In other words, to see her walk to that position Dans would have been position, humanizing her. Été the inscription R haunts the main character, napkins, books and pillowcases. Everything in the house belongs to the deceased Mrs. De Winter. Later, we discovered that Mrs. Danvers was left in charge while Maxim went away. So the reason why Rebecca's presence in the house is so prominent becomes obvious. Mrs. Danvers tries to keep Rebecca's spirit alive. In a way, Rebecca became Manderly. Gradually, though, our protagonist tries to establish herself as the lady of the house, declaring the now iconic line, I am Mrs. Mrs. De Winter now successfully taking that first step to separate herself from Rebecca's image, attempt that is later undermined as she dresses up in the same dress that Rebecca wore for the last masquerade. It's a brilliant scene where Hitchcock successfully captures the anticipation that she feels, which later turns into terror and confusion. Constantly intercutting between a tracking shot of Mrs. De Winter emerging down the stairs and static shots of Maxim talking to his sister with his back turned to her, the tracking shot places us in the same space with our main character and makes us anticipate showing every step she takes. The shots of Maxim get closer and closer as our character walks towards him, as well as camera plays from the main character's POV enhances the desired effect when Maxim explodes in rage noticing her dress. She thinks she successfully assumed the identity Maxim wanted of an heiress, a sophisticated lady, as the dress was copied from the paintings of one of Maxim's ancestors. Maxim's so-called favorite painting, as Mrs. Danvers told her. Mrs. De Winter confronts Mrs. Danvers, who mocks her, stating she will never be as great as Rebecca. The camera zooms in closer and closer to the young woman's face as she looks down at the roaring sea. In a seemingly hypnotized state, Mrs. De Winter almost commits suicide as Mrs. Danvers tells her to jump out of the window. We are placed right into her head, Mrs. Danvers whispering to her to take that one more step as if hypnotizing the audience with her, only to reveal how close we stepped to the edge with the camera pulling away from extreme close-up, up to reveal the pair almost hanging out of the window, when tension is relieved with booming rescue lights. Rebecca's body has been found. Ironically, dead Rebecca saves our main character. Later, Mrs. De Winter finds Maxim in a small cottage where he confesses that he killed Rebecca accidentally, which was the one big change from the novel as Hollywood censorship could not allow a crime to go unpunished, and so Maxim successfully turns from a villain to a victim. Rebecca taunted him and told him that she was pregnant with another man's child and was planning on ruining his family name. Interestingly, when Maxim describes how Rebecca fell to her death, Hitchcock does not resort to a flashback, but instead the scene involves the camera tracking her in an empty space, as Maxim remembers Rebecca's movement and the shot smoothly ends on Maxim revealing the place where she died. It is absolutely brilliant how Hitchcock is able to make this already suspenseful revelation even more layered with his direction. Maxim tells Mrs. De Winter how he hated Rebecca and our main character experiences relief. This is a turning point in the search for her identity. She is able to defeat her predecessor's image. A girl grew up, as Maxim put it. In a few hours, we've grown so much older. In a way, our character's psychological journey has reached its end. From this point on, the film takes on Maxim's perspective as we follow him during the investigation of Rebecca's death and him trying to cover it up. Rebecca's spirit has not yet been defeated. We find out that Rebecca had cancer and she lied and staged her own death, and used Maxim's rage to provoke him to kill her. One of Rebecca's past lovers calls Mrs. Danvers, conveying that Maxim will walk free with his new wife. As Maxim returns home, Mandalay is aflame. Mrs. De Winter and most of the house residents are safe except for Mrs. Danvers. She is seen in Rebecca's bedroom. 
the ceiling falls down, crushing her, and the camera pushes in on the burning R, inscripted on one of the pillowcases. Rebecca is dead.